Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 641, Information from Eating. Lugano, who had been observing from the sidelines, was taken aback when Lumian handed the thin aluminum foil to Ludwig and inquired if he wanted to eat it. Despite Ludwig's previous display of abnormal eating habits, including drinking a tube of human blood in front of Lugano, revealing all the corresponding information, Lugano still harbored reservations about feeding Ludwig just anything, especially something as unconventional as aluminum foil. After all, Ludwig was still a child. In the blink of an eye, Lugano witnessed Ludwig silently accepting the old, thin aluminum foil, stuffing it into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. Lugano found himself in a daze. Once Ludwig finished consuming the aluminum foil, he calmly turned to Lumian and inquired, which details do you need information on the cocoa beans used, the precise quantity, additional ingredients, the origin of the aluminum foil ingredients, the production factories, or the individuals most in contact with it? Lumian shook his head slowly. No need. This information wouldn't help track down Hisoka. Hisoka had touched the thin aluminum foil while wearing gloves, leaving behind no corresponding personal details. The patrol team had already confirmed that the chocolate packaging was common in Port Pilos, and there was nothing distinctive about the taste. As Lumian responded, a mix of amusement and surprise washed over him. He can even extract such information from eating as expected of a monster capable of recovering just by eating and gradually breaking free from the seal's constraints. Ludwig seemed to relish the delicacy. After a few moments, he remarked, the residual chocolate has a hint of depravity. Depravity? Could it be that Hisoka had carried it for an extended period, corrupting it? That doesn't make sense. Unless one was a demigod, Beyonder auras couldn't reach such a level. The only possibility was that they were on the brink of losing control, deep in a state of depravity. However, such a Bayonder's body would undoubtedly display various abnormal details. They wouldn't be able to leave the house. Stepping out would lead to discovery and pursuit by law enforcers. Could he rely on the human skin Bram mentioned for disguise? Lumian was initially puzzled, but then he asked with anticipation, a decadent aura from the Devil Pathway. Ludwig licked his lips, savoring the taste of the chocolate residue. Yes, at least a demon's. Demons? Lumian was taken aback and couldn't help but frown. Having extensively studied devilology, he knew that sequence four of the devil pathway was known as demon, representing a demigod. If the chocolate slightly tainted with a decadent aura came from a demon, it clearly didn't belong to Hisoka. Lumian wasn't arrogantly dismissing Hisoka's potential to have advanced to sequence 4. Instead, the aluminum foil and chocolate marks represented the state four years ago. Hisoka couldn't have been a demon back then unless he had become a desire apostle upon transmigration. If that were the case, his targets for the serial murders should have been sequence 6 or 5 Bayonders. Although Bayonders at this level were rare in Matani, Devilology didn't specify that serial murders could only occur in one location. Are you certain? Lumian looked at Ludwig for confirmation. Ludwig replied earnestly, A demon's decadent aura has a completely different texture from low to mid-sequence devils. Upon hearing his godson's response, an image suddenly surfaced in Lumian's mind. Hisoka standing within the wall of spirituality engaged in a special ritual to establish a connection with a demon. Throughout this process, a few pieces of chocolate wrapped in thin aluminum foil remained in his pocket. They were slightly tainted by the decadent aura permeating the altar, subtly and silently transforming. Yes, when I perform a ritual, I don't remove all my belongings in advance and leave them outside the altar unless there's a specific mention in the ritual requirements that I should avoid. As a conspirer, Lumian quickly made a guess and asked Ludwig, Can you tell which demon's decadent aura it belongs to? Lumian's current idea was that if Hisoka couldn't be found in the future, he would exhaust his resources and seek the help of the new city of Silver's demon hunter experts. He would set up a ritual and summon the demon who had established a connection with Hisoka. He would have it beaten up before interrogating it for information about Hisoka. 
Ludwig shook his head. I can't absorb such subtle information yet. All I know is that the decadent aura belongs to a family called Noise. Noise, one of the three devil families. The demon responding to Ahsoka's special ritual is from the Noise family. That's peculiar. How can a demon respond to a ritual remotely? It has to be at sequence 3 or even at the angel level. According to devilology, serial killers can summon projections of abyss demons because those devils can use the special properties of the abyss to respond, not because they have reached the corresponding level. However, the Noise family is a devil family active in the real world and hasn't entered the abyss. Lumian made many connections from the Noise last name. He concluded by listing three possibilities. Firstly, the demon responding to the Hisoka ritual was none other than the Noise family's angel. Secondly, it had reached sequence 3 and was located in Port Pylos near Hisoka. Thirdly, the Noise family had a close connection to the Abyss. They could borrow the Abyss's properties to some extent. Even a demon could respond to prayers from afar. Lumian pondered for a moment and asked Ludwig, Any other information? No, Ludwig replied, disappointing Lumian. Lumian handed over the remaining piece of aluminum foil. Try this one too. Ludwig didn't hesitate. Like many children drawn to the sweetness lingering on wrappers, he popped the thin foil stained with chocolate into his mouth and chewed. After a moment, while Lugano snapped back to reality, Ludwig looked at Lumian and remarked, There's more to this one. What kind of information? Lumian knew that Ludwig's special mention had to be of some value. Ludwig responded with the air of a connoisseur. This thin aluminum foil rested on a table marked by old blood and a splash of coffee. The blood belonged to a deceased male. The spirituality was initially potent, and the coffee was fermo blend, unsweetened, distinctly bitter yet fragrant. Upon hearing Ludwig's account, Lumian's mind painted another vivid scene. A few pieces of chocolate wrapped in thin aluminum foil lay nonchalantly on a table, soaked in old blood and spilled coffee. They seemed to share an intimate connection for an extended period. Then a hand reached out, snatched them up, and swiftly pocketed them before making a hasty exit. Connecting the dots, Lumian strongly suspected that the table had served Hisoka in a dwelling he once occupied. Do you have detailed information on the male deceased? Lumian probed Ludwig for more insights. Ludwig shook his head once more. No, unless I consume the blood directly. 1453. The bloodstains likely belong to one of the victims. Lumian directly support the authors on web novel. Surmised. He pondered whether this information was documented in the case file or elsewhere. Was Hisoka using, no, unless I consume the blood directly. The bloodstains likely belong to one of the victims, Lumian the table as an autopsy platform, or perhaps an altar. Lumian mused inwardly, a tinge of disappointment clouding his thoughts. Nevertheless, he refocused his attention on the Fermo coffee. He mumbled to himself, does this mean that Hisoka has a penchant for coffee, specifically the Fermo blend from the Paz Valley? The Paz Valley, nestled in the southern continent, boasted the renowned Fermo coffee, comparable to Faina Potter's Highlander coffee and the southern continent's own version. It was a luxury enjoyed mainly by the middle class for extended periods. In Matani, where both East and West Balaam produced high-quality coffee beans, such occurrences were rare. The locals had access to a plethora of excellent coffee beans, those unfit for export were sold at affordable prices, favored by both colonists and natives. Lugano, now fully attentive, cautiously added, I've heard that those who frequent Fermo coffee appreciate its bitterness and fragrance. However, those who prefer it without sugar are a rare breed. In essence, Hisoka's unique taste in coffee is uncommon here. Lumian smiled at Ludwig and remarked, Well done. If I apprehend the target in the future, I'll give him to you. When the time came, Lumian would likely be a sequence five. Moreover, he wouldn't give Ludwig the Bayonder characteristic. Lumian could ease his grip on the boy. Give, the notion sent a chill down Lugano's spine, a hint that his imagination might have run too wild. 
To others, gifting a beyonder of the devil's pathway might relegate the recipient to a life of servitude or worse, becoming an ingredient. However, with Ludwig, Lugano involuntarily shuddered. He didn't dare to think about it. Ludwig nodded, his eyes gleaming with anticipation. Lumian turned to Lugano and said, Don't you have a good grasp of Dutonese? Check Port Pilos this afternoon and find out which shops sell Fermo coffee. It's preferable if it's one that has been operating for four to five years or longer. All right. Lugano suddenly felt a surge of usefulness. In the evening, he returned to Suite 7 at B3 and reported to Lumian, there are only three shops selling Fermo coffee. One is on Cania Street in Resurrection Square. You mentioned Cania Street in Resurrection Square, Lumian interjected. Yes, Unit 21 on that street. It's called Matani Import and Export Shop, Lugano confirmed. Lumian fell silent. Isn't it close to Port Pylos's patrol team? In Port Pylos, on the third floor of the building housing the patrol team, Camus received the bounty and gave a fifth to his two companions. He then entered the telegraph room and inquired of the telegrapher, Do you have a telegram for me? He had previously sent a telegram to inquire with certain friends if they had any information on Louis Berry, the adventurer. Since they were in collaboration, he needed to ascertain the other party's situation first. The female telegrapher, wearing a sweet smile, straightened up and responded, Yes, from Ferrum. Chapter 642 Visit Camus extended his thanks to the telegrapher, retrieved his telegram, and swiftly scanned its contents. Louis Berry in Tision hailed as the most renowned adventurer in the Fog Sea over the past six months. Sporting a distinctive golden straw hat, he successfully hunted down the demon warlock Berman, earning a hefty bounty of 600,000 Verl d'Or. Furthermore, he collaborated with the Earth Mother Church in Port Santa to address the crisis surrounding the sea prayer ritual. However, the precise details remain elusive. Upon perusing the telegram, Camus released a silent sigh and remarked to himself, he's truly a great adventurer. It's no surprise he managed to handle that serial killer. Camus couldn't gauge the demon warlock's true strength, but the substantial bounty spoke volumes. The sum of 600,000 Verl d'Or was a testament to the demon warlock's threat level. Even if Louis Berry's fame stemmed solely from his encounter with such a formidable adversary, he undeniably stood among the great adventurers. It wasn't lost on Camus that Bram, the perpetrator of numerous murders that had kept the patrol team occupied for nearly two weeks, only carried a bounty of 50,000 Verl d'Or. Such figures tempted Camus to consider collaboration with Louis Berry. Reflecting on the substantial 600,000 bounty and comprehending Louis Berry's generosity, Camus tucked away the telegram and graciously commended the female telegrapher with an exaggerated flying kiss. Running his fingers through his tousled brown hair, Camus descended to the hall below. The evening had descended, and it wasn't his night for duty. He could head home and take a break. Out of the blue, Camus's gaze focused as he spotted the handsome Louis Berry, sporting black hair, green eyes, and a laid-back demeanor, seated on the sofa, casually playing with a golden straw hat. Approaching cautiously, Camus inquired, Is there anything else? Lumian ceased twirling the straw hat, sat up straight, and grinned. I've got something else to talk to you about. Realizing that one of the three shops that could buy Fermo coffee was on Cania Street, not far from the patrol team, Lumian's immediate thought was. Could Hisoka be hiding within the patrol team, perhaps as one of its members? Is the most dangerous place the safest? After careful consideration, Lumian considered it a possibility, though not particularly likely. On the one hand, among the seven Beyonders who were killed, including the Death Believer in Port Pylos, the Rose School of Thought's peripheral member, and the spy left behind in Matani by the Antis Republic, were secretive individuals, blending in with ordinary people. Without substantial information sources, it would be challenging for Hisoka to identify them as Beyonders and target them. This suggested that either Hisoka had a unique ability to discern Beyonders from ordinary people, or possessed a mystical item granting him such insight, 
or he had control over an extensive information network. The patrol team, being intimately familiar with Matani and Port Pylos, might have already detected something amiss with the Death Believer, the Rose School of Thoughts member, and the Intis spy and been conducting surveillance. Hisoka's membership in the patrol team would explain his ability to uncover a Bayonder's hidden identity and carry out the murders. On the other hand, if Hisoka, a Devil Pathway Bayonder, had joined the patrol team, suspicions would undoubtedly arise once the serial murders occurred unless he concealed his true pathway from the start. However, the patrol team differed from the curly-haired Baboons Research Society. Hisoka would need to use his abilities frequently during daily missions, making it difficult to conceal them for months or years. There was no room for mishaps. It wasn't feasible for him to meticulously prepare before each mission, adorning the corresponding mystical item solely to reveal his abilities in that specific situation, right? Even as a devil, he couldn't pull it off. Given that many missions had no specific target, devils couldn't foresee imminent danger. Driven by suspicion and uncertainty, Lumian took a special trip to the patrol team, visiting Camus to unearth new clues or gain inspiration to either confirm or eliminate the corresponding possibilities. What do you want to discuss? Camus furrowed his brow. Is this guy scheming to use the morning's bribe as leverage to threaten me? The dossier isn't particularly important. Even if I lose it, it's just a minor punishment. Wearing his golden straw hat, Lumian rose with a smile. Pointing at the door, he suggested, How about a cup of coffee? After a brief contemplation, Camus responded in a deep voice, Fine. Exiting the patrol team's entrance, Lumian made his way toward the Matani import and export shop. In the fading dusk, he immediately spotted Port Pylos's police headquarters diagonally opposite the patrol team. Numerous individuals clad in dark blue police uniforms moved in and out, some holding cups of coffee. W.H. Lumian's heart stirred. Could Hisoka not be a member of the patrol team, but a high-ranking police officer at the police headquarters? At a certain rank, the police collaborated with official Bayonders to access a wealth of information. Many official Bayonders investigations were conducted through the police due to limited manpower. If Hisoka held a significant position at Port Pylos's police headquarters, it was plausible for him to identify the three concealed Bayonders. Additionally, there would be no risk of exposing his pathway during routine missions, and acquiring his favored Fermo coffee beans would be a breeze. On the other hand, it was precisely because the Matani import and export shop offered a variety of coffee beans that Hisoka fell in love with the pure, bitter, and fragrant Fermo coffee without sugar. However, this was just one possibility among Lumian speculations. For instance, Hisoka, being a bold and self-assured individual, might have visited Kania Street specifically to buy Fermo coffee, relishing the incompetence and frustration of the patrol team. Alternatively, Hisoka might not be a Bayonder of the Devil Pathway, but simply possessed the corresponding sealed artifact and had mastered a unique ritual to appease devils. There was also the chance that Lumian was mistaken Hisoka might not be linked to the serial murders four years ago. With these thoughts in mind, Lumian contained his excitement and entered the Matani import and export shop alongside Camus. They reached the section where various coffee beans were on display and secured a seat in the attached coffee shop. Highlander coffee with milk and two cubes of sugar, Camus ordered from the waiter with a sense of familiarity. Lumian, on the other hand, opted for a cup of fragrant Intis coffee. While waiting, Lumian casually observed the coffee choices of other customers. Turning to Camus, he inquired, Judging by the name, are you a Phanapaterian? Camus hesitated briefly before truthfully responding, My full name is Don Givre Camus Castia. He was willing to share his full name as the telegram mentioned Louis Berry having a good working relationship with the Church of Earth Mother. Lumian chuckled. So, you're a noble lord. The name Castia belonged to the royal family of the Phanapotter kingdom, and Don, at the beginning of Camus's name, signified honorable, representing his noble status. Camus smiled wryly and remarked, 
If I were truly a nobleman, why would I join a local patrol team in the southern continent? Our branch has long dwindled, but I can't deny that this last name and the Don prefix have provided me with advantages beyond those of ordinary people. I received a potion upon reaching adulthood, achieving sequence 9 Bayonder status. However, my subsequent advancements were the result of my own efforts. Accepting my 50,000 Viral Door bribe is part of your efforts? Lumian teased inwardly. He glanced at the two cups of coffee brought by the waiter, feigning casualness as he asked, Don't you want to try some other coffees? Is Highlander coffee your only choice? Camus raised his cup and took a sip. I'm accustomed to its taste. Lumian removed his golden straw hat and took a sip, smiling as he replied, Fair enough just like how I can never acclimate to Fermo coffee. It's too bitter with regular sugar and too cloying with too much. Some people appreciate the bitterness and fragrance of Fermo coffee, opting for just a hint of sugar. Lumian anticipated Camus to respond with, yes, some even drink Fermo coffee without sugar. However, Camus's reply didn't align with his expectations. That's how it goes. What's on your mind? Internally exhaling, Lumian spoke openly. As you can tell, I'm deeply intrigued by the serial murder case from four years ago. It's my sole purpose in Port Pilos, a highly valuable assignment. Highly valuable? It's just a serial killer. Camus let out a sigh of relief upon realizing Louis Berry was interested in discussing this matter. Even if he were blind, he could tell Louis Berry's genuine concern about the serial murders four years prior. Lumian vaguely explained with a smile, This case holds secrets beyond your wildest imagination. For example, transmigrators, or that celestial worthy. Camus took another sip of his Highlander coffee and reflected. I arrived in Matani over five years ago. At that time, the Intisians had just departed, and the kingdom and the church's forces had completed their initial infiltration. I sensed numerous opportunities, thinking I could leverage my last name to secure a prominent position. Hence, I took a ship across the Fog Sea. The outcome differed from my expectations, but it was still acceptable. Camus, in his mid-twenties, sighed as he recounted the past. He continued, When the case unfolded, I was merely a sequence eight. Alongside a few teammates, I followed Vice, Captain Riza, to investigate. He paused, offering Lumian a smile that seemed to convey, If you want more information, show more sincerity. In that moment, Lumian was contemplating another question. If Hisoka truly belongs to the Devil Pathway and has joined the patrol team, is there a way for him to conceal his identity? Putting himself in those shoes, Lumian realized that concealing the abilities of the hunter pathway wouldn't pose a problem. Most situations could be handled with the ascetic pathway's abilities and a couple of items. Of course, the usage of an ascetic's abilities was suspicious. Could it be that Hisoka is indeed a bestowed individual who typically exhibits powers from the boon pathway? Lumian raised his cup and took a sip of coffee, avoiding delving into the details of the serial murders. He gazed at Camus thoughtfully and inquired, Do you have members in the patrol team skilled in divination or decryption? Chapter 643, Target Suspect Camus couldn't comprehend why Louis Berry had abruptly changed the topic and neglected to charge for the pertinent information. Recollecting, he mentioned, Yes, there's a magician. He was initially an officer of the Admiral Guard, but later got transferred to the patrol team. Later, Lumian frowned slightly. When did he transfer to the patrol team? Why do you ask? Last year, replied Camus. He had no clue about Louis Berry's inquiry, making it unclear what information was vital. Last year, it doesn't seem to be Hisoka, judging by appearances, although possibilities can't be completely ruled out. Serving as an officer in Admiral Querrill's guard provides opportunities for gathering intel. Perhaps he didn't purchase Fermo coffee from this import-export shop. It could be one of the other two cafes. Even so, there's a logical reason for buying it here. Yes, to relish watching the incompetence and frustration of the patrol team, Lumian temporarily placed the magician on his suspect list. 
He didn't dismiss the possibility that the other party was Hisoka, just because they were a sequence 7. This was because the level of a boon might not be the same as the level brought about by potions. Furthermore, Lumion had vaguely perceived changes beneath Matani's surface from the magician's departure from Admiral Quirarill's guard to joining the patrol team. Beyonders of the Seer Pathway either originated from the Church of the Fool or were associated with Intiz's Bureau 8 or secret organizations supporting Bureau 8 like the Secret Order. While there were wild Beyonders, very few evolved into magicians. Coupled with Matani's history as an Intis colony, Lumian reasonably deduced that the magician had close ties to the Intis Republic, a fact well known to Admiral Quirarill. He retained the magician in the guards to maintain a specific connection with Intis and handle the new Fainapotter kingdom. By achieving a balance of power, he could better sustain his rule. The magician's departure from the Admiral Guard last year might indicate that Admiral Quirrell had truly gauged the Fainapotter Kingdom's stance after years of collaboration and had sided with them. Lumian's speculation didn't eliminate the suspicion that the magician might be Hisoka. Loki, from Intis and a secret order member, held a mid-management position in Bureau 8. It was entirely possible for him to use the proper channels to involve Hisoka in Bureau 8's overseas section and recruit him into the secret order. After contemplating for a moment, Lumian inquired, Does that magician have a fondness for Fermo coffee? He didn't directly ask about the other party's name and characteristics. Camus shook his head. He doesn't appreciate coffee. His preference leans towards sweet drinks like Guadar. Guadar, a well-loved local beverage in West Balaam, was crafted from locally grown berries and contained a certain amount of caffeine. It had the same impact as coffee in enhancing mental strength and combating fatigue. However, its hue was orange-yellow, with a hint of sweetness amidst the sourness. It served both to alleviate the sweltering heat and quench thirst. Prefers sweetness. Lumian felt a sense of disappointment. Four years ago, Hisoka had no inkling that he would confront a monster like Ludwig in the future. It was unlikely for him to deliberately splash some unsweetened Fermo coffee on the table with the chocolate. Lumian cautiously believed now that Hisoka truly enjoyed bitter coffee. In that case, the magician with a sweet tooth probably wasn't Hisoka. Unless Hisoka meticulously maintained the traits of each identity, consistently playing the role of a magician who relished drinking Guadar on a daily basis. He wasn't an actor who needed to meticulously perform every aspect of his daily life. Moreover, he had no reason to digest Faceless. As he contemplated, Lumian's heart skipped a beat. Actor. If Hisoka is genuinely a Beyonder of the Devil Pathway, apart from his belief in the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings due to transmigration, he might also be influenced by the Mother Tree of Desire in his daily life. Could it be that the boon of the Hisoka Pathway doesn't come from one of the celestial worthy's seer, apprentice, or marauder, but rather from the Mother Tree of Desire? The current celestial worthy desires the invasion of evil gods into the world within the barrier. It's not implausible for him to collaborate with the Mother Tree of Desire and tacitly permit Hisoka to exploit the Mother Tree of Desire. With a fresh train of thought, Lumian observed the now silent Camus and took a sip of Intis coffee, offering a smile as he changed the subject. Any Bayonders from the prisoner pathway in the patrol team? He had long suspected that the Mother Tree of Desire was an evil deity at the pinnacle of the criminal, prisoner, and Scrooge pathways. The corresponding boons likely originated from one of them, or were intertwined. Lumian refrained from asking about the existence of the Scrooge pathway, because it was even more suspicious than the criminal pathway, also known as the Devil Pathway. It didn't belong to the twenty-two paths of the Divine. It was akin to a thief being apprehended by the police and asking in confusion, I clearly disguised myself and left no traces. How did you quickly lock onto me, only to receive the answer? This isn't Trier. No ordinary person would disguise themselves as a turkey and hide in a secluded alley. Do you think there's a spy from the Rose School of Thought in the patrol team? Camus believed Louis Berry was casually raising the issue of the Rose School of Thought's interest in Port Pylos. 
No, definitely not. He adheres to temperance and doesn't indulge at all. Lumian smiled. In other words, there really is a Bayonder from the prisoner pathway. Yes, a sequence six zombie, Camus confirmed. Lumian interjected suddenly, don't disclose who he is, what he looks like, or his characteristics. Answer a few questions first. What questions, Camus, feeling a bit disoriented from the rapidly changing topics, planned to decide when to ask for benefits later? Lumian held a porcelain cup filled with Intis coffee and casually said, When did he join the patrol team? Half a year after me, Camus recalled. You arrived in Matani over five years ago and joined the patrol team shortly after. Half a year later means that the prisoner was already on the patrol team when the serial murder case occurred four years ago. Lumian's spirits lifted as he pondered for a moment. Did he face a catastrophe in the past and nearly died? No. Camus shook his head. At least I don't know. Lumian maintained his smile, showing no signs of disappointment, and said, Does he have a liking for Fermo coffee? Yes, he adores Fermo coffee and is the type who doesn't add sugar, replied Camus without much thought. Then he remembered Louis Berry's inquiry about the magician's preference for Fermo coffee in the patrol team. He quickly formed a guess. Is there an issue with the ones enjoying Fermo coffee? Does the culprit of the serial murders four years ago have a taste for Fermo coffee? There are very few places in Port Pilos where you can get Fermo coffee. This is one of them. Even cafes selling Fermo coffee procure the beans from here. Are you suspecting that the murderer from four years ago is part of the patrol team? Impressive. You reacted swiftly and identified the core issue. Lumian inwardly praised Camus. Simultaneously, a surge of joy filled his heart. In Matani, Fermo coffee was a rare commodity, and those who preferred it without sugar were even rarer. Moreover, this individual was on the patrol team and seemingly from the prisoner pathway. With so many conditions aligning, Lumian felt like he had caught Hisoka by the tail. To avoid triggering any sense of malice and danger, Lumian refrained from asking about the patrol team member's name, appearance, identity, or characteristics. Feigning ignorance about the enemy, Lumian casually asked, Is he from around here? Observing Camus's silence, Lumian added with a smile, I won't claim the official bounty. Camus's expression eased. He's a local of Port Pylos, born in Tizimo Town, which is part of Port Pylos. Though the patrol team wasn't as stringent in member recruitment as the various churches and governments, they still gathered basic information and conducted verifications. Otherwise, Admiral Quirrell might have to worry about being assassinated by a patrol team member investigating a Bayonder case one day. Tizimo Town, the location of one of Hisoka's pranks, it fits. Lumian controlled his excitement, preventing the corners of his mouth from curling up. Regrettably, he told Camus, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the target. This was to prevent Camus from investigating the target. This could potentially alert the other party to the corresponding malice. All right, Camus shrugged. Curious, he inquired, how did you find out that the murderer from the serial killings four years ago liked Fermo coffee? I was already aware of such a person before starting the investigation. Lumian replied with a meaningful tone. He chose not to disclose that the information came from the thin aluminum foil wrapping of the chocolate. Revealing this might prompt Camus to believe he could uncover more clues and reignite the investigation, potentially drawing Hisoka's attention. With this realization, Lumian understood something. I should now be a target for Hisoka, but fishing has its benefits. Louis Berry, adorned with a golden straw hat, had bribed members of the patrol team to examine the files of the serial murder case from four years ago. Other team members paid little attention, but if the prisoner was indeed Hisoka, he would have detected Lumian his adversary's investigation into the four-year-old serial murder case. Hisoka refrained from taking action likely because Lumian openly presented himself as Louis Berry, making no effort to hide his identity. This led to the suspicion that Lumian was fishing, making Hisoka cautious of stepping into a potential trap. 
there was no sense of malice or danger perceived as Lumian didn't possess details about the suspect's identity. Lumian was merely preparing for a potential surprise attack from a devil or desire apostle. Before, I fished to catch fish, but now my fishing is a bluff. Lumian's thoughts clarified as he looked at Camus and said, Keep an eye out for anyone at the police headquarters who enjoys Fermo coffee. All right, Camus agreed, thinking that Louis Berry had identified the suspect as a member of the patrol team and the police through details he wasn't aware of. For now, the possibility of the patrol team members was tentatively ruled out. After finishing the remaining Intis coffee and settling the bill with the corresponding Verl door, Lumian donned the golden straw hat and maintained his smile. He left the Matani import and export shop and Kenia Street, step by step. Passing by Port Pylos's police headquarters, he deliberately cast a few glances. Chapter 644, Patrol Team Camus stood at the entrance of the Matani import and export shop, casually smoking a cigarette as he observed the passing customers. Despite his watchful eyes, he didn't spot anyone purchasing Fermo coffee. As the gas street lamps gradually illuminated the surroundings, casting a dark blue hue across the sky, Camus extinguished his cigarette and tossed it into a nearby trash can. He then made his way back to the beige four-story building that housed the patrol team. Originally planning to indulge in an intis feast in a neighborhood frequented by foreigners to celebrate his unexpected windfall of 40,000 Verl d'Or, his plans were disrupted by Louis Barry. By the time he returned, it was already late, and he couldn't be bothered to wait for a top chef to prepare something special. Instead, he decided to return to the patrol team, pool money with his close teammates, and order takeout from a nearby restaurant. After satisfying his hunger, he intended to relax at a bar or dance hall. While crossing the hall, Camus spotted a teammate with dark brown skin, thick lips, and a height exceeding 1-8 meters. Curious, he inquired, why did the guy in the straw hat come looking for you again? Heh, I heard you and the others caught a serial killer and got a bounty of 50,000 Verl d'Or. In Matani, the currency was commonly denoted in Verl d'Or and Deluxe copper coins, a system ingrained during Intis colonization. Despite Admiral Quirrell's control, there were no significant changes in this aspect. The only difference was a partnership with the Fena Potter Kingdom's bank that facilitated the free exchange of Verl d'Or and Gold Rissat. If he were one of the two teammates, either the magician or the zombie whom Louis Berry had asked about, Camus would undoubtedly be on high alert. However, the person standing in front of him was So, a Sequence 8 pugilist of the Warrior Pathway. So had joined the patrol team as an adventurer just last year and was known for having a pleasant personality. Besides a bit of laziness and a love for enjoyment, there were no significant issues. Camus laughed and said, that's my informant. Without him, I wouldn't have received that much bounty. So, with his single eyelids, had a realization. Did he come to you just now to get his share? Camus thought for a moment and replied, That's one reason. The other reason is that he's still investigating the serial murders from four years ago and wanted to ask me for some details. He had kept the case dossier hidden from the captain and vice captains of the patrol team, but he couldn't keep it from his teammates. Therefore, he had no intention of concealing Louis Berry's investigation into the serial murders from four years ago. Moreover, he planned to monitor the police headquarters to identify anyone who enjoyed Fermo coffee and seemed suspicious. He would need his teammates' assistance to some extent. Any progress? Any chance of claiming the bounty? So, dressed in a pleated shirt and carrying a broadsword, displayed visible interest. Camus wasn't ready to provide detailed information at the moment. He vaguely responded, he suspects that the murderer might be hiding at the police headquarters from four years ago. I plan to investigate discreetly. Why do you think the murderer is a police officer? So looked puzzled. Camus hadn't discussed this with Lumian earlier, so he pondered for a moment and explained, consider this. In the case four years ago, only Bayonders were targeted. Several of them usually concealed their identities. How could the murderer accurately locate them and know that they were Bayonders? 
Only us or those from the police headquarters at a certain rank can access that kind of information. It's easier to verify if there are Bayonders of the Devil Pathway on the patrol team. Four years ago, during their investigation, Vice Captain Risa had proposed this idea. However, he only suspected that the serial killer was hiding within the patrol team and hadn't considered the police headquarters or the Admiral Guard. Subsequently, the patrol team conducted an investigation and found no suspicious individuals, leaving them to shift their focus. I see a glimmer of hope and smell the fragrance of Viral Door, so said with anticipation. If you need help, feel free to look for me. I heard that Colobo and the others just followed you to the scene and each got 5,000 Viral Door. No problem, Camus readily agreed. Then he walked past So and along the corridor toward his office. At the door of his office, Colobo poked his head out, observing the conversation between Camus and So. Colobo, about the same age as Camus in his mid-twenties, had dark hair, azure eyes, and a slender figure. He held a pair of black sunglasses in his hand. He lowered his voice and said to Camus, Stay away from So for the time being. Why? Camus asked, surprised. Observing So vanish through the door leading to the hall, Colobo averted his gaze and explained. I have a feeling that something bad will happen if one interacts with him during this period. Then why didn't you warn him? Camus frowned in confusion. As a Sequence 8 robot of the monster pathway, Colobo possessed formidable spiritual perception and could vaguely sense certain things. I warned him. He thinks everything's fine. I even reported it to the captain. Colobo shrugged. As he spoke, the thin Bayonda recalled something. That adventurer, Louis Berry, is also dangerous. When I arrived at the scene this morning, I didn't dare to look directly at him. Occasionally, I would glance at him and see large amounts of blood, flames, and death. I didn't want to tell you at first. I felt that if I said it, fate would suffocate me. Phew, it actually seems okay to say it now. It seems I'm too sensitive. That dangerous, as expected of a great adventurer who received a bounty of 600,000 Viral Door at once. While Camus, who knew about Louis Berry's deeds, wasn't overly shocked, this was the first time he had heard a monster like Colobo describe someone in such a way. Camus patted Colobo's shoulder. Thank you. I'll be careful. With that settled, he asked curiously, was Louis Berry the first person to give you such a feeling? No, there's another one. Colobo shook his head. Who is it? Camus was surprised. Colobo's expression suddenly turned serious. I can't say. I'll die if I say it. I'll die. With that, the thin Bayonder swiftly left Camus's office. Upon returning to Hotel Arella, Lumian headed straight for the master bedroom. In the subterranean suite, even during the scorching season, a refreshing coolness lingered in the air. On the desk in the master bedroom, a neatly folded letter awaited Lumian. Madam Magician's response. Lumian picked up the letter and began reading. Excellent. You have a good understanding of yourself. The Rose School of Thought and the Numinous Episcopate will be managed by dedicated personnel. No need for you to take unnecessary risks. Concentrate on dealing with Ahsoka. If they request your help, you may cooperate. The Bayonder characteristics left behind by members of the Rose School of Thought, especially those of the Devil and Prisoner Pathways, come with a certain level of troublesome corruption. It's advisable not to sell them or randomly seek out an artisan to craft items. If you need to, you can sell them to me or let me find an artisan. Keeping them in the traveler's bag is also fine. Compared to the Shadow Branch boxing gloves, Mr. Fool's seal, and the attention and influence of other items on you, they're as weak as an ordinary newborn baby. Relieved by this response, Lumian took a breath and activated the black mark on his right shoulder, vanishing from the room. After a while, he materialized atop a bell tower on Avenue du Boulevard in Trier. Directly support the authors on web novel. Gazing at the luxurious champs' illicets in the distance and the already lit lamps, Lumian couldn't hold back any longer. He needed to carefully consider the information he had just obtained from Camus. With the Berserk Sea, the Fainapotter Kingdom, 
and half of the Antis Republic between them, Lumian could devise a plan to hunt Hisoka without worrying about the enemy sensing malice and danger. Perhaps only an angel could sense over such a distance. Though Lumian lacked specific information about his target or Hisoka's identity and had no concrete plan, caution was paramount when he had the ability to be cautious. Relying on his ascetic trait, he endured, putting aside thoughts of the corresponding matters. Only when far from Port Pylos and the southern continent did he carefully consider details, allowing his thoughts to run free. After an indeterminate amount of time, Lumian vanished from the bell tower. Clang, 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 the pendulum clock struck 7 p.m. The next morning. Upon entering the hall, Camus spotted Louis Berry, adorned in a golden straw hat, seated on a sofa in the reception area. Why is he here again? Recalling Colobo's warning, Camus frowned and approached with concern. What can I do for you this time? He asked calmly, keeping his emotions in check. Lumian chuckled. I need some information, but it won't be from you. Find a reliable teammate who isn't privy to our discussion yesterday evening. Meet me at the Matani Import and Export Shop. I can offer 5,000 Viral Door for this. A peculiar request, 5,000 Viral Door. How generous, is he trying to avoid a devil's danger premonition? Camus, an experienced official Bayonder, quickly made the connection. He refrained from overthinking and pondered for a moment before responding, agreed. Heading into the office area, Lumian rose and departed, making his way to the Matani import and export shop nearby. Soon, a man sat opposite Lumian, who was savoring his coffee. The man, with dark hair and a relatively thin build, was a member of the patrol team who had accompanied them to the scene yesterday. Today, he wore dark black sunglasses, giving him the appearance of a blind individual. I'm Kolobo. Camus mentioned a chance to earn 5,000 Verl Dor. The patrol team member introduced himself in fluent intision. Amused, Lumian observed Kolobo's demeanor. Taking out a pen and paper, he counted out 5,000 Verl Dor notes and slid them over. Write down the prisoner pathway Bayonder's name and details from the patrol team. Ensure I don't catch sight of it. Fold it into a square after writing. Colobo, almost as if blind, fumbled for the band notes. He bent down and counted, nearly burying his head under the table. Why aren't you looking at me? Lumian asked with curiosity. Trembling, Colobo replied, I fear I might truly go blind. Are you able to see something you shouldn't? From the monster pathway? Lumian pondered but refrained from probing further. Colobo turned around and swiftly wrote down the corresponding information on the table behind him, folding the paper and passing it to Lumian. Without a second glance, Lumian promptly received the information and stowed it in his traveler's bag. After settling the bill for his coffee, he headed to the washroom. His figure vanished once more. Chapter 645 Gifts after Louis Berry left the coffee area, Colobo breathed a sigh of relief. He removed his sunglasses, retrieved the 5,000 Verl door, and counted it again. His gut told him this deal would work out. That's the only reason he dared to risk coming to the Matani import and export shop. Still, his whole body had been trembling with fear. He couldn't even keep his eyes open most of the time, and his hands were shaking so badly that he was surprised it was legible. Trouble always waits until it's ready to explode, he thought, clutching his sunglasses. He stood up and headed for the door. Something was wrong. He could feel it. His body tensed with some kind of danger sense he couldn't explain. His heart raced as he scanned the place professionally, trying to pinpoint the danger. Colobo's footsteps changed sometimes fast, sometimes slow. He'd zip off in one direction only to stop short a few paces later. Colobo took in the morning sun, the quiet shop that had just opened its doors, and the handful of customers scattered about. Not a single pair of eyes seemed fixed on him, and there was no one lurking in the shadows, observing his every move. Yet, following his instincts, his feet carried him back to the coffee shop area. That's where he finally stopped, in front of the bathroom sign. Two years as a Bayonder taught Colobo the most important lesson, trust your gut. 
Without thinking, he yanked open the heavy wooden door and walked inside. The Matani import and export shop wasn't some back alley dive. This restroom was big. Three urinals, three stalls, and gas lamps flickered on the clean tile. Colobo headed to the sink to splash cold water on his face. Maybe that would shake this weird danger feeling that was creeping all over him. As he looked up, a face stared back at him in the mirror. But it wasn't his. The face was freakishly white. The guy looked late twenties, with light brown skin and eyes that flashed a dark, sickly green. He stared at Colobo with dead, cold eyes. Colobo's brain short-circuited as recognition hit. Twinaku Tupi, in the only prisoner pathway Bayonder on their patrol team. The guy had become a sequence six zombie last year. He was also the first guy to ever make Colobo's skin crawl. If he told anyone else, he got told him he'd end up dead. When Lumian asked Colobo to spill the beans about the prisoner pathway Bayonder on his team, something about it felt wrong. He'd almost bailed on the whole deal. He'd counted that huge 50,000 sum not out of distrust, but because he needed time to think, to weigh the risk. He decided to trust his gut, but he hadn't told Lumian about this feeling, this fear of Tupien. And now, here Twanaku Tupien was reflected in the mirror. This is a sequence 5 wraith power. When did he advance? Kolobo could barely think over the growing horror. Suddenly, his body felt like it had been dropped into an icy lake. Twanaku Twanaku's face in the mirror vanished. Kolobo could barely move. An icy coldness gripped him, the kind that chilled you to the bone. It wasn't his own hands that were moving they lifted without him wanting them to. A voice drifted through his ears, flat and emotionless. Looks like my cover is blown. You were actually asked to provide my information. I'll get out of Port Pylos, but I'm going to leave two gifts for Lumian Lee. What did that even mean? What kind of gift? And who the heck was Lumian Lee? Kolobo's thoughts were a jumbled mess. His own hands were tightening around his neck. Then, with a sickening jolt, he realized what gift the voice was talking about. Twanaku Tupi. N was going to kill him and leave a gift his dead body. But he said two gifts. What was the other one? In the four-story beige building of the patrol team, Camus sipped his Highlander coffee and read the West Balaam Telegraph, contemplating the deal between Colobo and Louis Berry. If successful, as an intermediary, he would receive 20% of the amount. Knock, knock, knock. A gentle rap echoed on Camus's office door. Please come in. Though not particularly young, Camus had ample experience, leading one of the patrol team's operations teams. If there were a vacancy for the vice-captain position, his only competition would be Twanaku 2PN of the prisoner pathway. The southern continent was a chaotic place, especially in an area torn between multiple factions. Whether dealing with the bloodthirsty Rose School of Thought, the ominous numinous Episcopate, ambitious adventurers, spies from various countries, or missionaries, danger lurked at every corner. Some would take the initiative to assassinate patrol team members, while others would rebel and escape. Meticulous planning was not uncommon, and even the patrol team members found themselves as targets. Consequently, the patrol team faced casualties every year, leading to a constant need for new recruits. Encountering more attacks had its advantages. Victorious confrontations often yielded valuable items and Bayonda-related ingredients. Many of the patrol team's advancement formulas and potions were acquired in such situations, creating a noteworthy trend. Compared to cities of similar size in the northern continent, Port Pylos had an even greater number of official Bayonders, especially mid-sequence Bayonders. However, they lacked higher levels of power or corresponding sealed artifacts. Camus found himself in a tight spot financially due to his rapid advancement outpacing his cousins. Arriving in Matani State and Port Pylos as a Sequence 9 Arbiter, he had swiftly climbed to a Sequence 7 Justiciar in just five years. His goal was to advance to Sequence 6 and become a judge, and he had recently been gathering the funds to purchase the necessary materials. If the opportunity to become a Vice Captain arose, the patrol team would certainly contribute resources to aid his advancement. 
spoils of war weren't always suitable for him. Sometimes he needed to trade with teammates or sell them to the patrol team for money. He patiently waited for the potion formulas and Bayonder ingredients corresponding to his pathway to appear. The patrol team, being relatively new, hadn't accumulated substantial reserves. Camus needed to find a way to purchase practical mystical items, regularly replenish charms, potions, and other essentials to stay prepared against assassinations and conflicts. In such a situation, money was naturally scarce. Chaos was a path to hell, but also a ladder to the top. Pugilist so entered. With his brown braids gently swaying so, clad in a sky-blue shirt and beige pants, approached Camus with one hand in his pocket, smiling as he asked, Have you seen Colobo? I need to discuss something with him. Camus had already prepared a reason. He went to the import and export shop to buy coffee beans. So tersely acknowledged, then I'll wait for him to return. What's up? Camus asked casually. So took two steps forward and smiled. There's an investigation we would like to involve him in. Maybe he can uncover clues that others can't. You bastards, aren't you concerned about Colobo getting hurt? Camus replied with amusement, lifting his coffee and taking a sip. At that moment, So withdrew his right hand from his trouser pocket, holding a poker card flickering with a metallic gleam between his thumb and index finger. The card portrayed a grayish-white clown. With a swift motion, So hurled the poker card at Camus's head. In the men's washroom of the Matani import and export shop, Colobo finally caught his reflection in the mirror. His skin had turned a sickly green, and his hands were locked around his own neck, the pressure making his bones crack. Twanaku Tupion stared back at him from his bright blue eyes. Kolobo tried to scream, but nothing came out. He wanted to run, but his legs wouldn't move. It was like his body wasn't his anymore, it was killing him. Ugh! A choked sound finally escaped Kolobo's throat, too quiet for anyone to hear. Fear and despair tightened around his heart. Then, Colobo's fingers slipped. A figure emerged from the shadows by the bathroom vents. Lumian black hair, green eyes, all dressed in black and white with a golden straw hat. A flicker of surprise crossed his face, then understanding. He held a black bone flute to his lips. A hum resounded, accompanied by a melancholic tune echoing from the dark red holes. Symphony of Hatred why did I only sense malice and danger now? Just as this thought crossed Twanaku's mind, Twanaku's murderous intent exploded, fueled by the haunting melody. Silently, a figure peeled away from Kolobo's body. It was Twanaku Tupian, his light brown skin gone deathly pale. Blood vessels bulged in his yellow eyes, threatening to burst. The symphony of hatred tore into Kolobo, already weak with fear. His heart almost stopped. He crumpled to the floor, barely alive. Lumian stopped the melody. Holding the black bone flute, he slid back into the shadows and under the vent. A moment later, he reappeared behind Twanaku Tupian, who was practically vibrating with murderous intent. Lumian lifted the flute, its blood-colored holes gleaming ominously, and took a breath. Finally, you're here, 